Recently, you've made some headlines uh, discussing your short tenure in WWE. Let's go back at that time period in your career and start things off. When you were hired by WWE, what promises were made to you about how you would be used and how the WCW brand was going to be promoted? When we, when we first was hired for the w, by the WWE, the promises that were made to us were, you know, we were going to, um, you know, get get a fair, you know, a fair shot. At everybody, everybody was. You know, even square. There was no promises, no guarantees. Um, this was the very first talk when 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 Shane McMahon showed up un, un you know unannounced at, at Panama City. We as the top talent, I'm with Sting, Goldberg, Nash, and we literally we wheel up and see that WWF trucks are there. And we're like, oh my gosh, what, what the hell's going on here, you know? So we, everybody scatters and goes to their people of what they know. Well, within five minutes before we could really find out what was going on, Shane McMahon, uh, they go, hey, uh, uh, there's a meeting in the room, so-and-so, Shane McMahon's going to talk. So we actually go in this meeting, me, Lou, I remember I was standing directly beside Lex Luger, I'll never forget it. Goldberg was right here, i never forget it. And we're like literally having no idea what's coming out except we know it's all bad. And Shane takes about three minutes and he says, uh, I just want to let you guys know we own the company. Uh, we're going to hire some guys. We're going to fire some guys. We're going to hire some referees. We're going to fire some referees. And uh, that's it. And everybody kind of give a half, half, half applause, half not applause. And so there wasn't any, not, from, from the very first meeting, nothing. So the first show came out and me and Lex were the tag team champs. And what we went on, we went on the show. So pretty much, if you're not on the very first show, you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not getting hired. Yeah. So we're like, oh my god, we're not on the show, you know. So I go to the truck, get ready to leave. Here comes Lex running out. He goes, we're on the show, we're on the show. So if you ever watched the very first show when Shane McMahon took the show over, and they were uh, Vince was via satellite in Cleveland, and we were in Panama City. Me and Lex do some kind of little interview. And it was live. We did some kind of interview thing. From there, we're depressed, don't know, had no ideas, no nothing. No promises, no guarantees, no nothing. My contract's up in two months. So I'm in a real bad position. Luger just signed for, like, I think, like 1.5 for three years. So no matter what, the, the event, we knew Vince taking it over. He's got to pay the contract. Yeah. So... The people that just read their contracts, they're, hey, so what? People like me were going, oh, no, what are we going to do, you know? So it came down to the time to, you know, let's talk. So I was making, I think, seven fifty at the time and uh, for a three-year deal, rented cars, hotels, uh, first-class ticketing, the whole nine yards, and uh, which, is a, which is a ton of money. And, and he uh, uh, came in. He had courted me about six months previous to this and uh met me flew me in whole nine yards me and my wife this is vince vince okay this mcmahon flew me in me and my wife limousine whole nine yards into newark stanford is i'm, I'm saying that right yeah stanford, connecticut, stanford yep. connecticut flew me in the whole thing and uh and this is before i think even he knew he was buying the company fast forward buys the company i become what's your name again Instead of, I said, wait a minute, we just met. Don't you remember us meeting and talking? And, and that was all gone then. Because now he owns the company. I've got no right, i got no stroke, i got no leverage. They offer me, I think, 175 And I said, Vince, I said, I'll have to sell everything. I, you know, it's a lot of money and thank you. I said, but I'll have to sell everything in, in, in the world. I'll sell my house, how to sell my motorcycle, my cars. I said, give me, I cannot give me, I cannot do a little better than that. I mean, keep in mind, no leverage. I think we ended up selling, settling at 225 or 250, you know, with uh, some incentives right. kind of thing. And still had to go home and, you know, I had a, I had a $5,000 house payment, you know, big mansion and all that stuff. Long story short, sold the motorcycle, did things I had to do to get my living back right and uh under the right thing and uh from that point the promise was fair shake and everything uh everybody's gonna be nice to everybody there was 12 guys hired and 
nine of them honestly wouldn't, I don't think, and I've got heat from this before, and I'll get heat again and I could care less because uh, I tell the truth. Nine of them I don't think were stars. Like your Sean Stasiaks, your, 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 your Sean O'Hara's, your Mark Gendrax, uh, your, your Hugh Morris's. He, he was a star, but, you know, I mean, really? I mean, star, star power, guys. I don't know, you know, whatever you think is a star or not. But the three main guys that WWF called their main guys that they hired were Dallas Page, Marcus Bagwell, and Booker T. And that was the main guys. The other guys were like the kid I hadn't gotten a fight with, which was Hurricane. You know, he wasn't considered one of the, he was one of the 12, but he, was, he wasn't even considered as one of the stars at that stage, we were told. So we go to school, they made us go to school, and that was like a setup for somebody to go, somebody to bitch about it. Right. Knowing I was going to bitch about it, I didn't. I went to school every day and learned the 20-foot ring instead of 18-foot ring, and okay, I get it, I'm playing along. And uh, so we found out pretty quick that it wasn't it wasn't going to be straight up it was i mean stone cold steve austin and me stunning steve austin and marcus bagwell go back to wcw days and i could tell we wasn't cool i was competition i walked in like a friend and all of a sudden i'm competition and steve was cool to me but i could just still feel and understood this is a different game we were now in competition full and everybody that was hired was was competition for everybody else so i understood their position fully and but it was to the max i mean like heat to the max so what i did to get the heat off me i came up with a brilliant idea i thought i said here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna go to vince and say look let's get past all this money stuff let's let's do this to get to the figure out back to the 250 i said let's let's just you ain't got to pay me for the last two months and that would have been about like 60 grand for me 60 80 grand for two months and he said um uh i said this is forget don't be i won't sit at home i'll come to work right away and my agent was brad small at the time he went mark great idea great idea so that got the heat off me, we thought. Um, I saved Vince $80,000. I come aboard with the contract he wanted. Because two twenty five, dollars when you're 31 and you're Buff Bagwell, you're still going to be a millionaire because I'm such a baby still. Yep. I'm in the prime of all of it. So let's suck hind tit for two fifty dollars over here, a ton of money still, knowing you're going to be in the half million dollar range in a few years and be one of their main players. You're in shape, you're healthy, you feel good. Let's get over as team, as friends. So I did so and was fired in two weeks. <laughs> so it was pretty rough. We, me and Booker knew it though. We wrestled, a, we wrestled a house show and tore the house down like me and Booker have done 10,000 times. And then the next night we were main event on Raw. And what people don't realize is, is seven days later, Raw was in Atlanta. Backyard and, of Ted Turner. And nobody really remembers that. And every time they got a question like, is this true and is that true? I tell them that and they go, wow. I said, think about it. Why would you not wait seven more days to put Buff Bagwell and Booker T as your main event? You would have been over, over. Over like we're over. So instead, he puts us in a bad situation. We go out there and have a horrible match and get booed out of the building. Our announcer gets booed. Shane gets booed. Stacy Keebler gets booed. Me and Booker go out and nobody talks about our match. Nobody calls a finish for us. Nobody does. So that at the end of the match, when we realized it was a clusterfuck, they came up and they took the heat. The WWF took the heat for it because Johnny Ace was, was he thought their guy, which was Pat Patterson. Pat Patterson was going to go do, he did the main events. Well, he didn't speak to us about nothing. I never even met Pat Patterson. And Johnny Ace didn't talk to us about the finish or the match. So we went out and did the best we thought in the WCW type match, and it got, it got shit on. It was horrible, and we kind of didn't have a good match, and our, you know, our chemistry was off that night. We, we got booed for the first time ever, 
And I think Vince knew that a little bit. I really believe it, that he knew that. If he didn't know that, then why did I get fired seven days later? People really believe that you're gonna fire Buff Bagwell over one bad match? Come on, man. Do you really believe out there in video world that Buff Bagel got fired because his mother? Do people really believe that I had my mother call the WWF and say, let him off Augusta in Birmingham? Well, fuck no, that's not true. Why would I do that? But people believed it. And one person was responsible, Jim Ross. Ross. And only God, Jim Ross, and me know the, know the truth. And who's going to believe me? Nobody. God ain't here to tell me. He can't, he's not on video. And Jim's going to say, hey, you know. And when I called Jim out on it, of course, he said, hey, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a bad job firing people. And didn't take the full heat for it. But the true, true story is Jim Ross created that monster and people believed it. Why do you think Jim Ross had heat with you? Why do you think you got fired? That's why Will let Jim Ross off the hook. It may not have been Jim. Jim made the call, and that's the route he took. He said, hey, it's a shitty job what I got here. It's a, it's a job I got to do. I got to call people. You know, it's a, shit, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bad job. You've heard his podcast, right, what he talked about? You know, no, like, I didn't. Oh. His quote was, uh, my former job as head WWE talent relations was oftentimes a thankless job. I never relished in firing people, and it only makes sense that if a talent could help a company, that I wanted them to make it. I'm sorry Mark feels like he does. I'm sure he believes what's there is true, but I never went out of my way to cause him any misery. I just was the guy that had to deliver the bad news. That's what he claims. And, and, and like I said, to be honest with you, that could be true, but somebody, and I was told it was Jim, somebody started the mother called in, and I verbally, what Jim's leaving out right there is on video, you can go out into the, you can go out in, into the video world and you'll know where to get it. They have a round table meeting, and Jim Ross rips my fucking ass out. So... If you're so right, Mr. Jim Ross, about poor little, your poor little job, and, you, and I feel so bad about this, and oh, I hate it for me, why'd you fucking rip my ass out in the fucking round table? I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't even see it because my dad told me not to watch it. But I know there's a video out there, and the videotape came out as me and Luger on the cover. It said Heat Seekers. Hmm. And it's Michael P.S. Hayes. It's that cocksucker Mike fucker Graham. And it's fucking dick sucking Jim Ross. And it's of a couple of guys that hate the young, good looking kids. And they went out on tape. Tape, so go find it, Jim, and look at yourself. Dog me the fuck out. When you lick my ass at WCW, follow me around like a little fucking puppy dog, asking me how my football career was, and blew me half the time you were fucking there. And then you try to bury me and say you didn't say nothing. Well, go back and look at that tape. And then say that, and you know what that equals? Is a fucking liar, Jim. You're fucking a fucking liar. You went out, you started this fucking th rumor that ruined my career. So I hope your fat ass, stroke face, eye, one eyeball feels good about that, you cock sucking fat piece of shit. Okay? That's how do you, how really, I feel about how do you really feel about Jim? Yeah, really. That's. <laughs> That's just kind of being blind about it. Right, right. So I, my next question, and I guess the answer would be no, is do you think you could ever mend fences? Absolutely not. There's yeah. no way. Have you ever seen him at any conventions or anything? Never. Never seen him once. Okay. Never seen him once, but uh, there's no way to mend a fence, brother, of costing me my life. Yeah. Jim Ross, I feel, and I just proved on tape where Jim Ross ruined my career. He started this fucking rumor about my mother and ruined my career. How do you mend that fence? It's true. How do you do that? Now, do I think he's the mass mastermind behind it all? Absolutely not. It wasn't his idea to have me and Booker in uh, fucking, uh, starts with a T, uh, Tacoma. Tacoma, Washington, where he wrestled that night on Raw. It wasn't his idea to do that main event and realize. I think something fell apart along the way. But I do think that Jim had all to do with what I'm talking about, about the mother calling the office and starting that rumor and everybody believed it. And I think Jim was a thousand percent behind that. And there's no way to keep from saying it. So that's now, after you were uh, let go by the company, they, they didn't want to say that you're fired. They wanted to tell you that you were <laughs> released, right? 
best part of the whole thing. I, I, when I got called into the room, they called me up and they said, you know, I, I, I show Jim's exact words, which once again, Jim, you're a fucking liar. When he did call me up that day, where well, there's no witnesses except Jim, me, and God, he called me up and he said, hey, buddy, we got big plans for you on Monday. So rest, let your head heal from me and Hurricane's fight. We'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, we'll get that in a minute. He said, let your head heal. He said, and uh, chill out, rest, relax, and we got big plans for you on Monday. Now, when you're Buff Bagwell, everything that was just said is 1,000% true. You're Buff Bagwell, man, and you just you just had one crappy match. Hey, man, sit at home, chill out. Let's let it calm down a little bit. Come to Phillips Arena and let's tear the fucking house down, right? Wrong. I show up to Phillips Arena. I'm all excited about what Jim had told me. I'm going to, you know, get a big something big happening today. And all of a sudden, Johnny Ace comes out and says, "Hey, can you um, come in this room for us?" So I came in the room. And when I walked in the room, I swear to God, it was so unbelievable that I even should have been fired to the world, to internet, to everybody listening to this show, to you, to the camera itself. Everybody out there knows Buff Bagwell should right now and should have been in the WWE the whole time. There's no arguing that. Jim Ross could not argue that right now. Triple H could not argue that on camera. There's no reason why Marcus Bagwell didn't have a second chance. I'm not sure what I did the first time, but a second chance if it was something I did wrong, don't do that again, that bad match. Uh, Mark, don't do this. Whatever it was I did, don't do it again and let's regroup. I've got a million texts, I mean, a million emails, a million people over the, over this 15 years that have told me that. So it's really a very sore subject with me, you know, that he's done that. But um, when I walked in the room, Johnny Ace finally calls me in, I go in the room, and it's Vince, Jim Ross, and Johnny Ace, and I swear to God, I did not think I was getting fired. I, did, I had no idea. I was like, oh, what, what's going on? I guess they want to... Talk to me about uh, part, Creative, of the show, yeah. part of the show tonight, you yeah. know? So I'm sitting there like Buff Bagwell would be sitting going, hey, what's going on? And all of a sudden, Jim starts kind of talking. And as he's talking, I'm listening, you know? And I'll go, wait a minute. You're, you're getting fucking fired. And it hits me. Keep in mind, I've only had one job in 45 years. And that was a wrestling job. I've been doing this since I was 20. Yeah. 19. I never had a job in my life, so I don't really know what it feels like to get fired. And I'm and I so it took me a minute, and I went, I, I think I'm getting fucking fired. And then all of a sudden, uh, I I raised my hand, and Vince goes, "You don't got to raise your hand, Mark." And I go, I said, Vince, I feel like I had to. I said, but, but are, are you guys firing me? And they, I mean, brother, they didn't miss a beat. Jim goes, no, 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 we're not firing you. And I went, Whew. he goes, we're releasing you. And I go, so I let him talk for a minute and I go, again. Right. And Vince goes, Mark, you don't got to raise your hand. I go, well, I'm just trying to be polite. I go, what's the difference of getting fired or released? And they had a fucking answer for that too. Well, they, said, they said, well, if we release you, we can bring you back in three months. And if we fire you, we got to redo the contract. And at the end of that statement, I said, start smiling, start shaking hands, you're fired, leave, leave on a good note. And that's what I did. I cut them off. I said, hey guys, gotcha. I even said, do you want me to sneak my bags out so nobody really... You know, hey, where are you going? This I mean, is at TV, right? Oh, we're at TV, yeah. brother. We're at Monday Night Raw. And Phillips, my family's in the crowd. The building's full. It's 5 o'clock. We're getting ready to go on. And so I, why would I be leaving with my bags? So I, so I was nice enough to say, hey, do you want me to, like, sneak out for you guys? Did you just fire, fucking fired me? I was trying to be nice. And they said, and they kind of threw them off. I'll never forget their faces. They were like, no, no, that's just, 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 just whatever. And they didn't really know what to say. I, they didn't really realize I was going to come back with something that nice of, how do you want me to leave the building? I mean, I really did. That's how much I cared. 
So sure enough, when they said that, here I go just wheeling out. And people are going, where are you going? Where, where are you going, Bible? Where, where are you going? The last guy, I just kind of said, I'll be right back. I'll be right back. You know, did that deal. Try not to cry. Realizing I'm going from, you know, being buff Bible to nothing. And I'm trying to figure it out, what's going on. Trying to get out the door without crying. And the last person I see was Chris Benoit. And he just had neck surgery. So he was outside, actually. I, try, I was trying to get to my car without crying. And he, he had pulled up in his car with his wife driving. Ex, well, you know, past his, uh, you know. Right. Ex, well, the wife that everybody, they went south on. And so he comes up and uh, he said, where are you going? And so I did tell him the truth. I said, man, I just, I just got fired, dude. He went, what? And I said, dude, I, 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 to be honest with you, I don't know. It's bizarre. I, I'm just, I'm just out of here, you know. Got in my car, called my parents, and I said, you guys can come home. And they go, what do you mean? I go, I'm home. And they were like, oh. So they fucking left, left the seats, got in the car, and that was it, bro. And then the rumor of my mother got me fired from Jim Rawl started, and it stuck like glue. People yeah. really, to this day, 15 years later, up to a, up to a year or two ago, every interview I did asked if that was true or not. And what and was I, the premise of that? That she called and didn't want you to work in that town? Supposedly, were- my mother called to get me out of those cities to let me rest. Because of the fight with Shane? Because of the head. I had already worked Booker T in a house show with my head. I had already worked Booker T on TV for the first match of the invasion with my head. Why would I call and cancel two house shows? So it's I can prove it, it being a crazy, stupid lie easy, but I can't prove it was Jim, but I think it was Jim, and I think I just proved to everybody in the world, if you just watch the round table and what Jim said, he's lying to us right there, and he's lying on the round table. But regardless of whatever the reason was, it stuck like glue, so bravo on whoever thought of the lie, because it fucking stuck. And man, it took, like I said, for 13 years, people would call me and go, why did, did, is it true about your mother? It faded off from why did your mother to is it true about your mother? But buddy, it stuck hmm. and I could not shake it. And my only comeback every time was, dude, think about it for a minute. You're Buff Bagwell and you think they're gonna fire you for a bad match? All right. You really think they're gonna fire you because your mother called? Well, fuck no, they're not. They're gonna say, tell your mother to quit fucking calling us, you know, and, and, and get your ass to the town or whatever. They're not gonna fire you over that for a 10 year run that they could have had me for in the prime of my life, in the prime of my body, everything. So they jerked away my whole career, you know, really pretty right, right there underneath my feet. Looking back, is there anything that you could think about? Like, could you have done something or? Could you- the, the only thing was, is I was, I was real fucked up. I was definitely fucked up, but on gimmicks, you mean? Or? Yeah, on pain, oh, okay. pain pills, drinking, that whole thing. But you know, I, we we were fucked up at WCW too. So everybody was right. everybody. I mean, not even there's no names to be called because everybody was doing. It, it was just literally come in this room and didn't know I was getting fired, and I was fired and left. Right in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> wow. So, and when you were in a grill position, I think they told you not even to look at the camera when you walked down the. Uh... <laughs> got, I got up to, in Tacoma. We got up there, got ready to go, and everything. And, and already, me and Booker know something's up because why would they put us in Tacoma instead of Atlanta? Yeah. Why not wait seven days for the big invasion? So we already know we're sitting there talking like this, covering our mouths, but we can't say anything. But we know in Tacoma something's up because why would they be doing this? But nobody's gonna say nothing, we're main event on Raw. We know, we know we're not main event. We're not main event material at this stage. There's no doubt about it. I'm not, I may not ever be main event material, but I definitely wasn't main event material then, ever. So we knew something was up to put us in main event in a different city seven days before Atlanta. So um, we, knew, we knew right there the wheels were coming off. So we get up to the go position and Booker goes out first and just to a, I mean, just the, the biggest booze I've ever heard. And I'm next. I'm thinking, oh my God, this is brutal. And so I'm trying to swallow all that. My music comes on and Shane grabs me, turns me around and goes, oh yeah, by the way, you can't look in the camera here. And I said, 
I can't, what? I said, have you ever fucking seen me come out? I said, that's all I do. I said, all I do is look in the camera and, and, and laugh. I said, that's the main thing I do. He goes, can't do it here. My fucking music's playing, bro. I'm, I mean, I'm getting ready to go out in front of a sold out building. And I said, okay, okay, so if you ever watch that match back, I like, I do, I come out and try to be me with the, you know, the fireworks and everything and I'm posing. When I come down the ramp, brother, it's like, I'm trying to dodge the camera because they told me not to. So right there, another, I swear to God, in my heart anyway, I feel was another ploy to, to, to throw me off my horse. And it worked. Their whole plan worked. So like I said, congratulations. The plan was fantastic and it worked. It just fucking ruined my life. But congratulations, it worked. But it, you know, it really did. It was, it, it, it worked, it stuck like glue. So don't look in the camera when that's all I did for five years, I mean, you know? When you got released, did you ever contact the office and said, hey, you're still <laughs> out here, you gonna bring me back? Probably five times. Who'd I'd you say. talk to, Jim again? A couple. Huh. Yeah, a couple. A couple times I talked to Jim and a couple times I talked to Johnny. And I probably did it, I'd say seven times. Seven times over, I been like the last five years, absolutely not. Last seven years, probably not. But the first eight, probably, I probably did it seven times total, but it would be like, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you guys are kidding, right? I mean, I mean, really? Um, but with Vince and them and Johnny, I say Vince, with Johnny Ace and Jim was the two I talked, the only two I ever talked to every time was John Ace or Jim, I get on the phone. And they get on the phone with me and they talk to me. And then finally, i never forget, I got the old from Johnny. It was the last time I talked to him. I was able to at least get out how I felt. I said, Johnny, let me ask you a question. I said, why is it that y'all taught us that being bad was good? And then all of a sudden, when I'm bad, it's bad. Why? Why is it I, I got this much heat that wrestlers would kill to have this much legitimate heat that y'all could do something with and you know it and you're not going to hire me and let me do something with it. Tell me what I've done. Tell me, man. And he goes, Mark, you're exactly right. So the only time I really felt like I got anywhere was that one Johnny Ace phone call. And it was, you know, that way he goes, Mark, you're right. Great analogy. I don't know why. You know, they all played, I don't know, but Jim was actually kind of mean to me every time. I say every time, two times maybe. The first time, I was told to call back in three months. So when I called back, Jim did the old, hey, Mark, with a deep breath. And I go, just like I go, Jim, I'm calling you guys back because you told me to call you back in three months. And it's been four months. I even knew Y'all didn't want me to call you back, but I'm doing what you asked me to do, so I still did what y'all asked me to do for you. You asked me to call you in three months, it's been three months and three weeks, and I'm doing, I'm doing what you asked me to do. And he was just very, you know, hey, we'll call you if we get a chance. I went from buff to Mark. You know, we'll call you Mark when we get a chance, and you know, da 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 And uh, that was like one of the calls, and then I, like I said, every couple of months, or every, Every year, probably would go by. And go, wow, are you fucking kidding me? Really? I don't gotta. I'm not at. Why am I not there? And it just always ended in a negative phone call. What are your thoughts on uh, why DDP never made it up there? Was it his age or the way he put his matches together? If I knew, I kind of wish I could give you a good answer on this, but I can't because if I knew why DDP didn't make it, I'd know why I didn't. So I've got no idea. I think at that stage, my true honest opinion is, at that stage, they just said, you know, let's just get rid of all WCW guys and, you know, and be done with it. I believe Booker made it because he's the best black wrestler in the world ever saw, ever seen, period. He was it. Think about it. You can't name a great black wrestler. And Booker T was fantastic. He was a great wrestler. He was a great talker. So I think he overrid the WCW thing because they needed a great black wrestler and he fit into it. He was perfect. He was the best. He's one of the best workers ever. 
He can talk great, and you can't name two guys right now. Junkyard Dog, are you kidding me? He had a great gimmick. He couldn't work. Booker T was perfect. He was a perfect candidate. So I think that's why when people go, well, he was WCW, I think that's why he made it was because they needed a guy like him, and he fit into the role perfect, and he was great. He was tall. He was big. He was one of the few man that we've all we tried so much to find you know he was the he was the tiger woods of wrestling he was it so i think he made it because of that but i think they really said you know what fuck wcw let's show them that wwf at the time still is the powerhouse and i think that's why we all went down you talked in passing uh, about the drug scene in, in WCW, and, and then you look back at some of the guys today that might have suffered from uh, different issues they might have had what are your thoughts on uh, the current state of lex luger for instance <laughs> Just talked to him the other day, man. He uh, it, it, it rips it rips my heart out is what it does because um, me and Lex were you know thick as thieves, uh, best friends, whatever you want to call it. But I mean, literally like inseparable. Uh, at one stage, I remember being on the road with Lex and him saying, "Do you realize we've made more contact with each other than we've made with our wives this past month?" And it threw me off at first. I went, "What?" <laughs> And I, then I realized he was right. Getting in and out of cars, you know, at the gym, you know, wrestling, you know, we've been on the road a month and I'd made more contact with Lex than I'd made with my wife. So I understood what he said. So that's how tight we were as friends. And it was me, it was me in the passenger seat, Lex was driving, a cooler behind Lex and, and Liz behind me. And that's how it was for a good, a good three years, you know, day in day out so yeah so i hate where he's at he does not hate where he's at he's in a great place he feels like i mean if you talk to him i don't know if you've talked or any interviews with him or yeah. anything he's on a he's really man he is lawrence Fole, and that's his real name and that's really that's what he is but when i see him it's real hard for me because i love him so much and he was such a I, you got to realize I watched Lex Luger on TV like you did, but then I wrestled with Lex Luger and was World Tag Team Champs with him. And he was the total package. He did look the best. He was the tallest, best body, leanest, biggest guy out there. He was the total package. And for me to see the total package in a wheelchair, it rests my heart out because I love him so much. But with his Christianity walk that's, that's, that he's doing and I'm proud of him that he's able to do that. He's done more than I was able to do. I've cried more about my position that happened to me than Lex has cried about his position being in a wheelchair. And that's pathetic. So I'm, I'm calling my own self out. I mean, really, that's sad. But Lex is just a triumphant of a man. He's so strong, powerful, hate his position he's in. Wish he uh, missed the days of working out with him in the gym and all that, but we're still very close. He's a great, great, great guy, and I'll never regret or take one minute back from the time we had together, and I love him to death. What do you miss most about WCW? Uh, the money, <laughs> I think. Uh, and, you know, really, that's, I mean, that's being honest, is the money. I mean, we're broke. You know, we went from being rich to broke. And, but it was not just the money, man. We were friends. We were up there. WWE was, it was the competition. It was a, it was a grind. It was, you know, backstabbing. It was at, and at WW, at WCW, we were on contracts. So it was, it was fun and, inter and we had a blast and, you know, brothership and just, it was just, it was a lot, it was much different. And, uh, but. You know, most of all, it's, it's of course, to be honest, we would say money, but I still, um, it, it's all of it, man. I mean, you know, just, I told you, the guy that brought me here today, like one time, I mean, one time Eric hauled our bikes professionally, had them hauled to Minneapolis, you know, 40 motorcycles, 40 Harleys, and we rode Harleys from Minneapolis to Sturgis all together. I mean, with a, with a mechanic with us and a mobile home if you want to get off and put your bike on the trailer and ride in the mobile home. I mean, that's rock star stuff, you know? Yeah. And, and you're riding with all your buddies. 
I mean, it was just unbelievable. So there's a lot of great, a lot of great stuff that went down, but you know, in, in the end, a, a lot bad happened in the end. You know, who, who do you blame for WCW falling apart? Um, I blame, I blame, uh, God, I blame, I blame the company. The, uh, the what happened really, what people don't know, and and keep in mind, I'm saying something that I don't 100% know, and this goes back to my father saying believe nothing of what you hear and half of what you see and i believe in that saying i didn't i didn't hear this i was told this but it's what made the most sense and i've gone with it and that is when aol and ted turner merged aol did not want wrestling aol time warner did not want wrestling and so they at that stage ted turner owned less stock than them when he owned less stock, very simple, they had more power. We were doing two O's and three O's, and the NBA Finals was doing ones. So there's no reason to get rid of it unless you just didn't want it. We still were doing great ratings, but they pulled it and sold us for nothing, and that's once again, half of what you hear, none of what you see, I mean, half of what you see, none of what you hear. You know, it kind of falls in that category again, but I heard it was just, like three or four, five million dollars that they sold it to Vince for, you know, which is just ridiculous. Now during that time, Bischoff was trying to buy it, but who I blame the most would be AOL or whoever hired Vince Russo, because I just think Vince Russo started the, you know everything wrong. You've made a number of appearances uh, on TNA over the years. What are your thoughts on that promotion, and why do you think it hasn't really taken off? TNA. I feel was exactly like WCW. I feel like they were exactly like WCW. They were just right there, man, like WCW was for so long. They were right there, right there, and it just didn't glue, and I don't know why. I watched, and I rooted for them, and I even had several thousands and thousands of emails that wanted me to go to TNA over, over uh, going to Vince, and that blew my mind. But it was that it was that kind of strong and that kind of strength. But if you remember WCW, they we we wasn't known either, and until Rick Rude went out and said what they were doing on their show the next week, and we told that show, for some reason people kind of started switching, and then that's when the power changed, and that's when you had the Monday Night Wars. But I don't know, man. I don't know that answer, and I just know that. It, feel, it felt like when I watched them, that they were just like WCW. Something needed to happen. They were just one click away from being mega stars, and it never happened. Jeff Jarrett, what are your thoughts on him uh, personally and professionally? Did you get along with Jeff? Me and Jeff were really great. I don't know. Something happened with me and Jeff, too, that I don't know happened. But me and Jeff were great, great friends um, all through WCW. I mean, great friends. And to the point where Jeff was... I think, and I think he would admit this too, I think he would, Jeff was a lesser star than I was at first when he first came to us. I mean, he was, you know, I think a bigger star worldwide, but at the time, Buff had really took it off, and Jeff had kind of was at WWF, and then came to us kind of, but then when Russo came, he really got his push back again. But when he first came to us, I remember, you know, him, him, you know, not riding in our cars, and he kind of did his own little thing. And But then all of a sudden, man, me and Jeff became great friends. Too Cold Scorpio. Wow. Let's talk about him. I, dude, I... Have you, have you guys reconciled? I know. Okay. So obviously, I've, I've seen your documentary clip, and we sat down with uh, Scorpio 12 years ago, maybe. Maybe a little less than that, maybe 10 years. And we did the interview with him. Right. We're the ones who conducted that interview. You are? Yes. Okay. We are. So then I, I want to ask you the question. Sure. First, let me tell you that anybody that knows Mark Bagwell at all knows that everything I just said was not 99% true. Everything I just told you was 100% true. I swear to God on my whole family that Scorpio's entire, and not entire interview, but 90% of it was a lie. What, why did he do that? I have no idea. We, 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 we the, only, the only thing we held on to, me and my manager, we held on to that whoever conducted the interview paid him to do that. 
we we so just did obviously it. we know now that's not it. Yeah, we did a normal interview like we're doing with you, and this then he, we asked him about Marcus Bagwell, and that's what he said. I mean, that's we did, fucking great. Yeah, like, like I said in my documentary, for starters, once again, if you know Mark Bagwell, can you imagine me letting a fucking guy tap my wife on the head and say I'm gonna fuck you later on? Listen to me, bro. I'm not saying I'm gonna beat you up, but there's gonna be a fight. Right there, there's going to be a fucking fist fight. I may get my brains beat out, but there's going to be a fist fight if another dude taps my wife in the forehead. It was like he was on crack cocaine or something and lost his brain. I do remember the situation. He's telling the truth about that. We went to St. Martin, and this fucking motherfucker probably don't remember this, but they even read the reason why we were there. We went to promote Ric Flair's gym. And it was during Easter, and a lot of the guys were hot about it because we'd been on the road for so long. But we went to St. Mark on a paid-for trip. Once we got there, we were like, this is great. All right, all right. So Scorpio, we went down there. I took my wife. He did not take his wife. I do remember there being a first-class seat thing, but we're world, we're tag team champs, of the, we're tag team of the year. We're great friends. Uh... As far as I knew, we were great friends. There was no problems. Everything was great every time. I mean, me and we're buddies. And then he goes off on this seat thing and listening through the walls at us argue while he's fucking his girl and he'll fuck my wife. And it was bizarre, dude. It was so bizarre. I had to go where I went as a man and tell him on the documentary, like I told him, that the next time I see him, and I'm going to say it again for another video, the next time I see you, I'm walking straight up and knocking your fucking teeth down your throat. So don't don't try to shake my hand. Just know that if you see me anywhere, there's going to be a fucking fight because you said that much that I've got to defend myself. It's ridiculous what you said. But I want everybody out there to know that he, <laughs> it's a fucking lie. I've got no idea what he's even talking about. He did go off the base of a true story that happened of us going to St. Martin. And he got fired right after that. Hmm. So, and I asked him why. And back then, I didn't really understand the business and right. you know, all that. I didn't know how it worked. But supposedly, he got for smoking pot or something. But that was, you know, that was it for him. He was gone right after that, if you remember. Because I went to Stars and Stripes, and you never saw Too Cold ever again. So, like I said in my documentary, if it was something I did wrong, why did he get fired? And why did you never see him again except a little short run in the WWF is Grand Funk Master or whatever he was, whatever it was called with the feather in his hat. So I don't know. It was really bizarre, dude. But when I saw it, it tremendously pissed me off, of course. It hurt my feelings a lot because it wasn't true. So we, to put it in my brain, we just had to assume, well, maybe the the guy that worked for him, maybe he paid him off or something. Nope. Now that we know that's not true, yeah. I really don't know, man. It was just a I normal interview know. and we asked him about you and that was it. It is the craziest thing. When I watched it back, somebody called me one day and goes, dude, you got to see this. I turned it over there and I was just speechless. I was like, oh my God, why would he, why would he go there? And why would he go there? What date was that, roughly? I was like 10 years ago. Were you there? Ten, uh, say, let's, let's just what, stay there. 2004. <laughs> stay, stay there. Ten years ago, why would you now, ten years ago, tell a story about listening through hotel room walls at fucking your wife? I mean, ten years? I, it was just the most bizarre thing I ever seen in my life. Why not come to me? Why not tell me, and and then and then lie about it? I mean, come on, man. Anybody that knows Mark Bagwell knows that I'm a fighter. You're gonna tap my fucking wife on the head and tell her I'll show you how it is to get fucked. I was like. Is he really saying that? Does he know what he's saying it? So my honest opinion is he was either on some kind of major drug and don't really remember it, but it still can't help. Even when I was on major drugs, I'm responsible for what come out of my mouth. He's going to be held responsible for that. And when I see him, I'm going to beat his fucking brains out. So, you know, I just, I hate it, but I can't let it go. He said way, way, way too much, bro. I have, I've, I've, I've tried to kill people for less than that. So what he said is just non-forgivable ever. And there's no way to reconcile that ever. And like I said, I see him anywhere. And I wrestled him in between that 10 years. 
and we tagged together and it was the best, I, we had the best time and hung out. And then it wasn't but about a year later, somebody said, man, you gotta go check this video out. And I was like, oh my God, we just wrestled with each, it was up here too. Right, right. Somewhere in Jersey, me and him tagged together and had a really good show together and everything. And and then I see, I was like, oh my God, so I've got no idea, bro. <laughs> it was bizarre. That is odd. Are, are you friends with uh, Scotty Steiner? Were you friends with him back in the day? Did Oh yeah, right. <clears throat> me and Scotty were actually great friends, as close as friends as you can be with Scotty. Scotty's real, real to himself. He's very quiet. So me and Scotty were definitely friends. Something happened to us too, though. Something, something along the way happened, and that's just, you know, just that just happens in this world that we live in when you start getting popular and things. Things happen, but with me and him, every single night. I went out as his manager, and if you noticed, I was very careful on not taking the spotlight. It was all pointed at him and making, measuring his arms and putting him over, and he's the man, and me running around him and making him the star. And he go out, cut his interview, hand me the mic, I do my little interview, and we do his match. Every night was the same. All of a sudden, one night, he cuts his interview, hands the mic off. Keep in mind, I'm trying to stay over. I'm, I'm buff back. I'm trying to stay over. I'm trying to, you know, keep do my part. So I didn't say nothing. No big deal. You know, I kept, I went to Scott and I said, "Hey man, are we cool? Is everything good?" He goes, "Yeah. What do you mean?" I go, "Well, you didn't, you know, hand me the microphone tonight." And he goes, "Oh, he goes, ah, oh, no, that's okay, okay." Well, next Monday night, we go out. Same thing. I come out, do the pointing at him. And you're the man. You know, the big man, like I always would do, because Scotty was the, the, he was the freak. He was the man. He was getting over, and I put him over, just like I should have done as a manager. And I put him over, put him over. We come out, he cuts his interview, and hands it off again. So I came out of the back. I said, Scotty, what's going on? He brought up some kind of story he heard at the gym. And I said, stop. I said, bro, if me and you are going to start listening to people outside of this world we're in, we are... We've gone from nobodies at center stage to rock stars, bro. You can't listen to Mark Wallace at the gym saying something about he said, she said. That's, I said, bro, I'm telling you right now, we're not going to stay friends a month if you do that because people just, that's how people are. Don't, don't do this. Don't do this to us. So he goes, I, he goes, okay, you're right. You're, I'm sorry. You know, the very next week, he goes out, cuts the interview. And hands the mic off again. I go straight to Eric and no heat, no mad, no yeah. yelling, no screaming. I went to Eric. I said, Eric, I, you know what? I said, I'm back healthy. I don't need him. And he don't need me. I said, so let's just break it off. Eric loved it. Made an angle out of it. Had a little angle between me and Scotty and went to Super Bowl with it and put the Steiner brothers back together. So we made a good angle out of it and it was a good thing. But me and Scotty stayed friends through the whole thing. Now that match, I did have to go, uh, keep in mind, Scott, he's, he's, he's a freak. Hmm. So I had to go up to him and go, do I need to defend myself? And that's all I asked him. And he went, no. And I said, okay. So I didn't know, I needed to know if I needed to defend myself out in the ring. I didn't, this was live TV. We're getting ready to do a match together. We haven't spoke, we didn't call nothing that match together. None of it was called, none of it, we didn't go over anything. We just, went out, so right before we got ready to go out, I said, do I need to defend myself? And he said, no. And I said, okay. So I didn't know until we locked up if we were cool. Did he take care of you? And he did. Okay. And he did. So he locked up, he took care of me, and we were in, we've been friends ever since. Who's your best friend in the business? Uh, for years, for years it was, uh, it was Sting. For years and years and years. And then he introduced me to Lex. And then it was me and Lex for years and years. Um, Who are you close with today? I think I think through the whole storm, Lex. Lex, okay. Yeah. Were you close at all with Eric Bischoff, or just absolutely? Did you look at him as your boss? No, we were we were close. We rode bike. We were Harley's separate Harley rides together and stuff like that. But Eric was not a Buff Bagwell fan at all. He had to. Nash and them went to him and said, look, man, Bagwell's really cool. You're missing out on it, da 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 And we were out at a club one night, and Eric didn't like me, and I knew he didn't like me. And and we got we was all partying and stuff at the club, and, and Eric goes, 
he made a couple of fag comments. You know, every every good looking guy in the world has been called a fag. Well, I've been called a fag a thousand times. And so the fag thing got brought up and he fagged this, fagged that. And I let it kind of go a couple of times. And he finally said, hey, back, well, you know, something about a fag again or something. I said, I said, Eric, hey, how's it feel? He goes, what do you mean? Well, how's what feel? I said, how's it feel that a fag gets more pussy than you do? And this is the boss that everybody goes, I'm like, what the, are you kidding? And he just busted out laughing. From that point on, we were, we were tight. Was Eric one of the boys or was he the boss? Was he the boss figure? Eric, God, Eric, to me, Eric always kept his distance as one of the boss. He really did. Like, I remember calling up one day, I called in sick for Nitro. Who would ever call in sick for Nitro when you, a private jet is waiting to take you to be a star on TV. There's guys that I'm gonna go meet tonight at a wrestling show that would cut their arm off for that and I call in sick. Well, I didn't know Norton had called too. So Bischoff gets on the phone and goes, get on one of those fucking things that I fucking let you buy over there at your fucking house and get to the fucking airplane. And I said, yes, sir. So, I, you know, so he, right. was, the, he was the ball okay. for me. Okay, yeah. Yeah. We talk to Tom Zink anymore? I was just thinking about him. On, is he one of the 70 or no, not? No, he's alive. And he's not. Yeah. I know. That's from great. But he isn't hiding. But no, I don't. What do? What's the latest on him? Nobody talks to him. He pretty much doesn't want anything to do with the business. Last well, I, mean, I heard, Minneapolis yeah. living with his parents yep. and, and was doing some kind of internet stuff. Yeah. And that was 10 years ago I heard that. Um, Steve Austin, were you surprised at his success in the business? Not at all, man. Steve, stunning Steve Austin, dude, was one of the best workers in the business. And we knew that going into it. Now, am I surprised at what came out of the WWF thing from seeing him as stunning Steve? A little bit, yeah. But I think, you know, all that would happen that way. Look at The Rock. Rock wasn't The Rock at first, you know? It took, it took, it took Steve a little time, and then you get a name and a little bit of a gimmick and a little bit of a push, and man... He's fucking done great with it, but stunning Steve Austin for WCW, I remember him being hurt a lot. I was, I was, remember I was a rookie. I don't really know. I remember I did a 10 minute match with him one time and I survived the 10 minutes. And that was huge for me. It was like, you know, five, four, him pit your know, roll up three, two, and right. I kicked out one. And I, I went draw with Steve Austin and that was huge for me. So. Steve Austin was considered always one of the best wrestlers in the business. Did Missy Hyatt at all? <clears throat> just saw her at, at WrestleCade. Just saw her at WrestleCade. She pretty much really helped you out when you first Not started. pretty much. She totally, got you into the business. Totally got me in the business. Yeah. And told me how to act and everything. She taught me how to keep your mouth shut, don't ask for the money, don't worry about the money, learn the business, shake hands, you know, be